Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. My name is Piero Scaruffi. This program is sponsored by the Stanford Deans of Engineering, Humanities and Sciences, uh, Medicine, Mechanical Engineering, and by Continuing uh, Studies. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the program, <clears throat> uh, LASER stands for Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous. Uh, go to lasertalks.com and you'll find a lot of details. I don't want to waste uh, time going into the long story of the lasers. Um, if you go to lasertalks.com, you'll find that the talks that we uh, we've had over the years, you will see everybody from uh, architects to physicists, um, virologists uh, to street artists. There are now laser series in more than fifty universities worldwide. Um, tonight, today, depending where you are, uh, we have a special event. Uh, usually the lasers have, uh, my lasers have three, four speakers on different topics. Tonight we have one topic. Yeah. And uh, we, this is a special on uh, Russia's alternative media art. And we invited, I invited Nina uh, to moderate. And then we invited artists and curators uh, from the uh, Russian uh, scene, art scene. Uh, so each will give a, a short presentation followed by <coughs> uh, QA. Uh, so we will actually introduce each one separately. I, I just uh, read the names, Nina Segedli, Anna Franz, <coughs> Elena Gubanova, Natalia Kolodze, and uh, Olga Pishko. Um, uh, extensive bios, very important if you want to know Everything about them, we have extensive bios at lasertalks.com with link to their respective uh, uh, web pages. Uh, feel free to post questions um, on the QA. Mm -hmm. I'll try to uh, I'll try to keep an eye. Um, what else? We are recording. Uh, okay, I'll introduce Nina. Uh, Nina is independent. First of all, Nina is a very modest person. She has an amazing amount of knowledge and she has been doing things like the lasers way before I started uh, <laughs> calling them laser. And she has an incredible network all over the world. She travels everywhere. Uh, she's joining us from Toronto. She's an independent curator, media artist, researcher, educator, originally from Eastern Europe, uh, but now based in uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, I didn't say it, but uh, it, everybody's in a different city, New York, Miami. Each of you can say where you are based today, Italy, and so on. Um, and, and as I said, Nina collaborates internationally on art and science. Uh, Nina, you want to try to share your screen and then... Uh, not yet, uh, not yet, but I'm a little bit later. Uh, it's your turn now. I'm done. I will talk, but the, the oh, I see. comes a little later. Okay. Oh, so, yours. Hello. The podium is yours. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome, everybody. Uh, first, I really would like to sincerely thank Piero and all the presenters, the speakers today for making this special laser possible. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, Piero already mentioned, the Laser Leonardo Arts and Science Evening Rendezvous series is an independent network. I would like to emphasize because today is very important that it is an independent network. And uh, today it spans the globe. For nearly a decade, I'm a pro proud co-host uh, in Toronto and Montreal, Canada. And uh, they are, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. So these lasers are very informative, those ones which we organize, but very informal. So this is a nice combination. And uh, the lasers always bring together a wide variety of 
presenters and audiences. Just this last month, we had uh, the proud uh, writers and artists, Stan Stanley and his wife, Z Zena, who just uh, published the Anthropocene cookbook. And uh, we were listen to them in Toronto while they were zooming for Oslo. So we try to do our best. <clears throat> today's, to be very serious now, uh, today's event exemplifies the vital importance of presenting information on contemporary media art events and projects. This we propagate because we really would like to make sure that uh, beyond the US and the European centric uh, events, we go much beyond and involve people from different parts of the world who are also coming with a different background and with different projects. Now, Piero, I have to share my screen. So art is a catalyst and it uh, prompts us to think global, act local and collaborate internationally. <clears throat> As Piero mentioned, I'm an independent artist with some academic affiliations and in my role, as a catalyst, I prom <clears throat> I created and curated over decades multidisciplinary projects in many locations. So I show you a few examples. I, I now how we get there. Yes, okay. So <clears throat> this is just a little taste of all the places I am going and working. This is symbiosis, and uh, <clears throat> this was in uh, working together was a title, and this was in Pachuca, Mexico. This is aerospace atmosphere. This is. Uh, was shown it, uh, up in an uh, observatory on the mountainside in New Plymouth, uh, New Zealand. And it's the north and the south uh, pole and the climate about it. So here we go in the different places all over the world. This is resonance. Resonance is built on uh, Nikola Tesla's uh, concept and it went to many places uh, touring in Europe mostly, but in, also in North America. And this is a visual collider project with Markus Neustädter. And this also toured in quite a few places and it, uh, has something to do uh, in terms of the concept uh, in the, uh, with the Large Hadron Collider, but it's just the concept. And this is the latest um, big project. It was last year, Sensoria, the art and science of our senses. And this was uh, actually uh, both in Poland, in Gdansk, Poland, and uh, Toronto at York University. We had uh, exhibitions, performances, residences, and uh, all of this built up under the first, uh, first uh, pandemic. But I don't want to take more time. I think there are very interesting presentations coming up. I would like to hand over the platform and please, Anna, can you start? Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Franz. I'm artist, curator, and founder of Silent Media Art Lab. 
I'll start, uh, I'll read a quick historical no note on the Russian media art and then show a small video. Uh, natives of Russia have a long time tradition in media art. Uh, I'll, start, I'll start with Dziga Vertov, uh, who after the Russian revolution of 1917 was developing a revolutionary filmmaking style based on perceptive nature of the camera lens which he was, uh, was known to call his second eye. At the same time, a Russian symbolist, composer Alexander Skryabin was developing a synthetic experience via color system based on Isaac Newton's fundamental nature of light. Following his ideas, Vladimir Baranov uh, Rusin uh, builds optophone, musical instrument that projected colors via refraction. Leon Thurman invents Thurman Box in 1920, musical instrument based on principles of physics and engineering played without touching the actual instrument. Thurman Box gave the world a means of expression, clear, clearly prefiguring the electronic imagination. Bulat Galeev, Soviet media art pioneer, found, uh, founded the Promete Institute in 1962 in Kazan, where his team engaged in research and experimentation with recorded light and sound. Films were intended officially for Soviet astronauts. In 80th, Vladimir Kobrin created a special metaphoric style work of imaginative filmmaking in which special effects, pixelation and reverse or speed up motion abound a philosophical avant-garde film entirely unexpected in the USSR at that time. In 1999, Olga Shishko, whom we have with us today, <laughs> founded Media Art Lab in Moscow. Media Art, uh, Art Lab was the first organization in Russia to study, exhibit, and promote media art in all its forms. I'm sure she will tell you more about it later. In 2007, Silent Media Lab was formed. The idea was to create a platform for artists and engineers to collaborate. Idea wasn't new. Silent followed EAT lead. EAT stands for Experiments in Art and Technology, organization formed by Billy Culver, Robert Rauschenberg, Robert Whitman, and Fred Walhauer in 1967. In a way, one could say that Silent continues the cause of EAT, since both initiatives have aspired to create a platform for collaboration among artists, engineers, and science. Since 2007, we have more than 100 works of art produ produced by Silent via art tech collaboration, which were shown all over the world. Year later, Silent initiated SciFest Art Tech Festival that later became the largest international media art tech festival in Eastern Europe. Um, the first SciFest constituted um, a small program of events. The festival exposition opened with Andy Warhol's installation Silver Clouds, contributed by the Artists Museum in Pittsburgh, USA. The festival has also been memorable by the exhibition history of EET, which Julie Martin, Billy Kluger's widow and collaborator brought to St. Petersburg, Russia. From 2007 to 2023, over 350 artists and collectives participated in SciFest. SciFest is a nomadic cultural event. Since 2013, its exhibitions, concerts, performances, video screening, lectures, and masterclasses have been held all over the world. Since 2020, Silent has collaborated with the International Society for the Arts and Sciences and Technology uh, Leonardo, contributed to the Leonardo Journal, and organized laser talks. I will follow with a short video about Silent and SciFest, and later on, uh, Yelena Gubanova, silent artist and silent sci-fest curator and grand a great friend of mine will tell you about her artistic practice. Let me share the screen.
Thank you. My name is Elena Gubanova. I'm a multimedia artist and curator of SciFest, one of the largest international media art festivals in Eastern Europe. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Piero, to invited me for this conversation. And uh, uh, Anna just uh, told us about the background of establishing the Southern Media Art Lab in St. Petersburg. Important to know that St. Petersburg is a museum city, but at the same time, it is a very conservative. Art education is a very archaic system and the academic art program has not been changed since Stalin's time. And so overcoming this, uh, for us, it was a very great victory to do many good uh, exhibitions um, in this city and to invite so many people uh, and to open interesting for them for the multimedia project and multimedia art. Uh, the, we set uh, ourselves to go. The first one is to show the great, famous, interesting multimedia artists from different countries at the our festival. And uh, the second goal is to integrate artists from the local community into our project working with our engineer and curator. So they are, this is, uh, you can see our guest in festival. It's uh, uh, Phil Niblock, very famous uh, musician from um, USA. And uh, Vidoka, uh, he's, uh, um, he's, uh, Artist founder, the editor in chef of Airfluxus magazine, and uh, many others, very famous artists, took part in our festival during this time. Uh, Cyphers is nomadic uh, cultural event. The first Cyberfest was a small program of several events. The festival exhibit was opened by Andy Warhol installation, Silver Cloud, like Anna said about that. And uh, in the following years, Surface consistently expanded, becoming more and more complex. And since uh, 2013, exhibition, concert, performance, and video screening uh, take place over the world. And we usually do uh, a big project at three, five museum venue in the city, and then organize two or three exhibitions around the world during the year. Often uh, inviting local artists to participate. Uh, after the, the well-known events, we moved to Silent Media Lab to Armenia and in the last two years, Yerevan has become the host of the large festival. Uh, by the by, the way, the situation in art in Yerevan is somehow similar to that in Saint Petersburg. They inherited the conservation conservatism of art education from the former USSR. Uh, uh, however, young Armenian artists show great interest in our festival and our laboratory has already supported several Armenian artists this year and we exhibit their, their project in uh, last uh, SciFest sci in Yerevan. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, Southern no longer cooperate with the Russian government agency and institution, but we continue to invite Russian artists to our projects and are now, look, and now looking for them all over the world. In addition to say, uh, to say that in uh, addition to the SciFest Festival in Yerevan, we are planning to promote the art and science project and establish an international residence in the field, in this field. We held a series of introductionary meetings with the heads of various scientific institute, institutes and group of engineers. 
According to the project, selected artists will be provided with an opportunity in year one, scientific laboratories, such as Arbeli Institute of Physiology, Physiology, Physiology and the Botanic Garden, the Engineering Campus, and the Burakan Astronomical Observatory. And uh, it will be international open call, but of course, Russian artists who were forced to, to leave Russia will take part in this project. So it, it will be in future, maybe in the next year or, or how it will come, but, but we don't know because it's not so easy, but uh, the uh, scientific institution in Yerevan very open and very uh, agree to contact with an artist and uh, to show big interesting to collaborate with the artist and uh, to, to do some uh, interesting project. So, uh, sorry. Uh, festival project in, uh, so I, I show the, our last uh, uh, festival project in Yerevan in High Art Culture Center, very, very nice uh, exhibition halls. And uh, we are very proud to take part there and to do the uh, our exhibition, there, our festival there. And uh, in, we invited this year, we invited a uh, very, very famous artist uh, from, from many countries, uh, from Italy, from uh, USA, from uh, England. And, uh, and we invite the Armenian artists to do it together. Very, very good exhibition. It's so. Uh, I think it uh, was a very good experience to uh, collaborate like that. And so I show you some fantastic view of uh, ex exposition. And uh, I want to say something about our last project and festival project in Venice and New York, 2019-2022, organized in collaboration with uh, the Kaladze Art Foundation, combined works to uh, contemporary artists with the crea creations of classics of the 20th centuries. Eric Bilatov, Ilya Kabakov, Michael Shemakin, Ernst Nizvestin, Francisca, Infant, uh, Valentina Povarova, Lydia Masterpova, and others. You can, now you can see the, uh, some part of exposition. This we continue explore, exploring the integration of art into new media. As a curator, I find it interesting to show that the new ex expressive means often come into contact with classical method and goals dealing with space, form, color, and composition. But with the technology, projects are gaining new topi topical. By, the, by, by displaying technological works together with painting and gra uh, graphics, we are looking for common meaning and interaction between the work by artists and different generations. Uh, now I would like to show several works made in our laboratory. Uh, and, and I would like to show uh, my work. So the first work are my object made together with my husband, Ivan Gorakko. Ivan and, and I uh, received an academic art education and before meeting silent, we were engaged only painting, sculpture and installation. The lab gave us opportunity to explain our artistic language. And over the last past 15, uh, 20 years, we have changed creativity. And what is important for us is a symbiotic for the classical image in the modernist sense with technical solution. I start to show, uh, to talk about that because I think it's very important for the field of uh, generation artists who graduated in academic uh, school and who uh, had the same uh, art story like we, and I, ex uh, I took part the artists like my my age on this generation. I can say, 
many times in uh, our Southern uh, Southwest Festival. And it was very interesting for me to compare this, uh, this generation artist with absolutely young artist with absolutely other meaning. And for me, mm, uh, therefore, I want to say about about them. So, um, the, for example, as it is a large kinetic object Danai from 2014, we combine mythology, art history, and life theory. We took Rembrandt's painting Danai, exhibited in the Hermitage as a base. The first analysis eye movement, uh, the first we analysis eye movement using eye tracking technology. You can see this on the slide. <laughs> then, so then we created a compositional image of the painting in the form and structure for the gold mirror on the wall. The spotlight we placed on the opposite wall was pro was programming programmed in such a way that it's being moved across the mirrors as if it were the viewer's gaze. We placed light sensors and moving mechanism on the mirror. Under the ray of light, the golden mirror trembled and erotical shrank for the touch of the ray of light. The idea was to combine the ancient myth of erotic creation with the physical world, knowing that light exert physical pressure on object, which can be calculated using Maxwell's acquaintance, and come up with a new image for this for this uh, that would co correspond to paint, myth, space, and world also have a technological solution. One small video. Um, so I just want to show maybe from what was this one? So uh, here's another work, a tribute for to Michelangelo Fresco work creation. You know, everybody knows it. With the help of Southern engineer, we produce two robotic arms. One hand is an image uh, of a future person, the other is an image of the god of the future. Uh, man assumes the function of the creator. This is our future. However, we see a uh, reason to write to uh, the right to image that the dialogue between the creator and the creative subjects remain the same. Just to robotic hand reproduce the very emotional dialogue that could occur between the creator and man if we received Michelangelo Fresco the world creation. Treat, despair, and 
resignation, the robot created starts. Answer the creator of man, and everything is controlled from one outlet. That is the the that is there is no different creation treats the itself and forgive itself. So, as you can see, we are constantly referring the, to the history of art, uh, to this, uh, transformation image of the past and trying to give them new expression and read the meaning in accordance, accordance with the new time. But here are works made in our laboratory by young artists who have no had any art academy training. For example, this uh, here is a work by Vasily Bakanov, uh, Slow Burn. By the way, Vasily Bakanov uh, is a cook. He's a uh, uh, working restaurant and uh, makes uh, fantastic uh, dishes and uh, etc. And uh, he has a friend, uh, our, our engin engineers, who works in silent and he was very often guessing in uh, our laboratory. And step by step, he started to think about the art and uh, suddenly uh, he created uh, it's, uh, this uh, um, project, uh, Slow Burn. Uh, it's, uh, I can show the video now, just a moment, very short. Uh, there are three fruits inside of the white cube under artificially created and regularly maintained conditions. Fruits undergo three uh, chemical reaction, caramelization. Typically, typically these cooking processes occur within a few minutes. Here is a uh, extended in, in time. And this process is shown in real time in YouTube. The image appears static. The slow burn of still life is constantly online and on display of everyone to see, but a sense of the process reminds me. The process near death, no life, is artificially prolonged body state between. Mm -hmm. So, and the process neither death nor life is an artificially prolonged borderline state between. The fruits have already been picked from the tree, and formally the end is how long and uh, and nobody know where where it will be and extreme uh, ex uh, experimental laboratory is still live with an artificial white life shows the borderline state of transmission from one death to another so that's a finish uh,
I want to say that uh, the show, the to show that the Silent Lab project is very fruitful for the various traditional group of artists, very untraditional group of artists with different backgrounds, adapting new technology both in society in, and in art is not an easy challenge. Uh, and our in, initial initiative helped to discover new opportunities for self expression for creative artists. And it's uh, very important for all of the world in different countries. It doesn't mean where, in Armenia, in Russia, in uh, Italy and everywhere. So to, therefore we do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, we will talk later, maybe later, a little bit about details of other projects. Thank and you. Are you ready? Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. And um, uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And thank you so much, uh, uh, Nina, for the invitation, and Pietra. Uh, and uh, I'll basically share my life story, what I've been uh, doing for years and how it's... Uh, affected my values and the mindset. I am founder of Media Club in Russia and my life absolutely changed uh, during last uh, year. And now I left Russia uh, more than one year ago. And now I live uh, in uh, Venice uh, and uh, I work uh, with uh, University of Oscari. And um, I was one of the pioneers of, uh, in shaping media art uh, culture in Russia. Uh, back in the 90s, I worked at the Soros Center for Contemporary Art. Uh, the Soros uh, Center's network was a significant organization that helped promote contemporary art in post-Soviet countries, providing opportunities for international exchange. We organized the first event and festival Focused of new media art, such as uh, uh, such as the International Symposium New Media Logia or International Exhibition New Media Topia, and uh, this center played a, a crucial role uh, in uh, advancing contemporary art in Russia. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in 1999, uh, it was shut down. And later uh, on, all sorts of uh, structures uh, were declared uh, um, undesirable organization in Russia, and which means that cooperating with them could result in legal trouble. Uh, by the way, thanks to my work in this institution, I got to know, for example, Katerina Hoffman, uh, Nina Zaglady, uh, and. Um, Katie was the main curator of our program, New Media Logi, and uh, she worked with uh, us uh, as a curator and invited uh, star uh, from uh, um, different countries, such as uh, uh, Steina Vasilka, Heidi Grudman, Peter Weibel, uh, um, uh, at the turn of the century, my husband uh, and uh, I uh, founded a non-profit organization, Media Art Club. Uh, uh, it was a research platform for media art, and uh, it was the first organization in Russia to study, exhibit, uh, and, and promote uh, uh, various uh, forms of media art, uh, like video art, sound art, uh, uh, net art, uh, um, interactive art and split uh, screen cinematography, uh, including uh, CD-ROM art uh, and uh, video games. Over the past 20 years, uh, Media Art Lab uh, builds um, its own international community of media artists, uh, exper uh, experimental um, um, uh, filmmakers and video activists. Alexei Saev was an artist who had also been working with new media forms because uh, he believed uh, that uh, technology apply the form of thinking. And, uh, and, uh, and it was um, the duty of an artist to reflect on them. He realized um, uh, that without someone documenting and introducing the work of Russian artists, 
people would soon forget the experiments and uh, they wouldn't even be recognized as artists in the professional art uh, world. Uh, Soon, the art club uh, began creating its own media library, and um, uh, we started uh, sharing and exchanging archive with other countries from the former Soviet bloc. Well-known artists, Stein and Budi Vasilka, whom I mentioned before, gave us their work uh, archive for educational uh, purposes. Uh, there were many events organized by, by media art club uh, for the first time in the country, and this is include the first digital art uh, festival, the first conference uh, on media culture and copyright, uh, and the first police screening, and the uh, first anthology of Russian media art, uh, uh, which was presented in the official Moscow Film Festival. Uh, and um, it was uh, in uh, 2000 uh, when Media Art Club re uh, released an uh, uh, anthology of Russian video art. Uh, uh, it was um, showcases at the Moscow International Film Festival, and it was a surprise for a commercial class Class A festival. Uh, and those an alternative program media forum. Uh, emerged within the commercial festival. Media Forum was a festival that uh, digs uh, into the connections, uh, uh, conflict, uh, conflicts between film and uh, video art. International uh, experts collaborated uh, with Media Art Lab to um, showcase something new in Moscow, and they carefully uh, selected the most experimental uh, works to impress the audience. And um, among the films in the program was uh, Jack Smith's Flaming uh, Creatures, now recognized uh, as an art house masterpiece. In the uh, 1970s, its screening in the, your country, in the uh, United States, uh, could lead to legal trouble as it was considered uh, pornography. But it, it's really a masterpiece. Uh, we, were, uh, we were concerned about the potential reaction uh, uh, from an um, uh, uh, um, anti-part audience and the possibility of actual legal consequences for showing this film. So we made uh, sure to ask um, uh, everyone at the entrance if they really knew what they were about to watch. During the screening, we kept the doors closed to uh, prevent uh, anyone from accidentally uh, 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 entailed. And uh, coming things like this happened often because the Moscow Film Festival hadn't had the, this kind of screenings uh, before. Uh, one story that sticks in my memory uh, is when just before showing the film of Ken Jacobs, uh, uh, American avant-garde filmmakers, uh, 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 Jacobs uh, deconstructed uh, the pound, often uh, corroded film and uh, experimental extensively with strobe. And just before the screening, I got a call from a film te a technician uh, uh, saying that K had received a damaged film. Um, uh, and um, uh, uh, if at the media forum we uh, showcases media art and uh, experimental film and video art. Uh, then at Procontra Symposium, another project of Media Art Lab, we engaged uh, in discussion about it. As a part of uh, Procontra, this was a historical roundtable discussion about internet censorship. After organizing uh, festivals and net art exhibition, I got a call from the Russian uh, government. Shaking with nerves, I went to uh, Russian White House, uh, where I met Andrei Korotkov, uh, who was responsible for uh, um, uh, government information. He told me they were seriously considering bringing uh, China-style internet censorship into Russia. Uh, but he was again, it, it was a uh, uh, perfect uh, person, he uh, now not live. 
Yes, there were uh, still honest uh, politicians in power at the time. He asked me if we could organize a discussion with Russian and international experts uh, on that. Uh, since uh, it was a political matter, we held the discussion right in the White House. It brought uh, together 35 uh, theorists and artists, some of whom uh, had trouble getting uh, past security because they looked uh, like artists. There were some big name European internet theorists uh, like uh, Inke Arns uh, and Grasmuk Faulkner. One of the biggest Russian media companies even broadcasted it. A lot of people saw it, and uh, long story short, uh, uh, we managed to avoid introducing internet censorship uh, uh, 25 years ago. By the way, they are currently working on a Russian internet following the China model, you know. Uh, in the 90s, uh, including media art, became a way to express freedom. In this sense, media art and Russia has always been uh, a manifestation of the political. Uh, the Media Art Lab uh, main founder, uh, my husband Alexei Saev, uh, uh, passed away in 2006. And looking back, uh, um, it uh, coincided completely with the death of democracy in Russia. You may know that the Internews organization, which supports independent cable television, even a small cities, it was uh, shut down in Russia in uh, 2007 because uh, of uh, pressure from uh, um, regulators. They used to support Media Art Lab and together we were even thinking about uh, finding artists uh, uh, a place on television's uh, counter-propaganda. Uh, media art in Russia gave a strong boost to freedom, but it uh, also contributed to its destruction because there was so much visible freedom that it became dangerous. Uh, during that time, we attracted uh, a lot of uh, interest in media art. Uh, after the closure of all the cultural center that had been supported, uh, supporting us, Media Art Lab, I managed to integrate media arts into a state institution. Uh, and uh, I uh, worked in Pushkin Museum uh, for uh, five years. Uh, where I, I established a new media department. After the pandemic, Moscow main, uh, Moscow's main museum reopened it with a personal exhibition by uh, uh, Bill Viola, uh, and I was a curator with Kira Perov, uh, and uh, I approved of this. Uh, we celebrated the 20, uh, 20th anniversary of Media Art Lab uh, in a very symbolic way. During the pandemic, uh, we gathered virtually in front of uh, screens. Uh, the pandemic made it uh, easy uh, to connect, but it also raised new question about uh, what accessibility um, and freedom mean, uh, especially with the wars and epidemics uh, nearby. I am proud uh, of the project, uh, call it the golden age of Russian avant-garde, uh, which uh, uh, you made with Peter Greenway uh, in uh, 214. Um, you know Peter Greenway, very famous filmmaker from, um, uh, uh, from the UK, who is now based in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, in this project, uh, Greenway analyzed uh, the um, uh, lives of 12 Russian artists from the early 20th century and told the story of how their dreams fell apart because they decided to work with the uh, government uh, that crushed them. And um, uh, the main work uh, of Greenway's project uh, was Malevich's Black Square. Uh, um, uh, it can be seen uh, as a play, emotionless surface or deep, and um, mm, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, it could be uh, um, like a black hole that uh, swallowed um, up uh, the characters uh, of Greenway's film. Today, this project uh, project uh, for me seems uh, prophetic, to, uh, prophetic, and not only to me. Uh, 
Uh, finally, uh, in Guinea's work, the black square breaks into a million pieces. Uh, today, everything uh, has fallen apart. People, especially the intelligentsia, uh, left Russia as uh, the issue of Russian immigration in the 20th uh, century uh, is a sensitive uh, topic for Russia. Uh, it's our history. Uh, but now we find ourselves within the, the, uh, this history, um, inside of uh, this history. Many of my friends uh, have, uh, have left, uh, not only artists, but also musicians and uh, performers and writers. And they are not just trying to survive. Uh, they are still actively continuing their critical uh, work uh, in media art and contemporary art and uh, music. Uh, um, I am currently involved uh, in uh, projects uh, uh, where I try to keep the spirit of freedom alive. In both cases, art and new technologies lend me uh, a hand. And uh, uh, I must say, uh, I have also immigrated to Venice and uh, I am studied and working here and, uh, uh, at Kaposka University by the way. I moved to Venice also because I did two of my favorite exhibition projects here. Uh, but that's a long story, so I'll just uh, show you a couple of pictures. Uh, uh, it was a project in the, in the Palazzo Saran Savanaxelia. It was about media art and the freedom and the, our uh, gaze and uh, our difference gaze. Uh, and uh, the another project dedicated to the uh, anniversary of Tintoretta, but uh, I combined uh, the media art, uh, um, active media art with uh, uh, active works of Tintoretta. And we made, uh, especially for this project, uh, uh, different uh, artworks with Gary Hill, with Dima Krimov, uh, with uh, uh, Irina Nakhova. Uh, um, and I would like to present to you uh, another two, uh, two uh, contemporary of my projects uh, because uh, uh, they influenced by uh, my past. And uh, one of these projects is Making Diaspora, a research platform that connects the past and the present. I'm working uh, on this project uh, at Kaposka University in Venice and uh, thanks uh, to Professor Silvia Burini. The Media Club Archive is now also housed uh, at Kaposky University, and I am very grateful for it. Uh, and uh, I have the possibility, we have the possibility with uh, our team of uh, university to create new uh, big data of uh, artists who left uh, Russia now and uh, continue to work. Uh, and um, finally, um, uh, Many creative uh, individuals who have uh, dedicated uh, uh, their life, uh, uh, lives uh, to fighting uh, injustice uh, have chosen to leave their home country, uh, forming an, um, diaspora, new diaspora. They left because they can't make peace with the current environment and uh, uh, they want to be to get a picture of art uh, that doesn't uh, die but uh, continue to resist and uh, live. And um, uh, I'm also a part uh, of another project uh, called Cifra, uh, Cifra, a visionary platform for media uh, art that uh, functions uh, as a streaming. But uh, uh, its design allows voices from different uh, regions uh, worldwide to express themselves. It also helps media researchers, uh, curators, uh, and artists connect and listen to each other in the, from, North, uh, from different countries. Uh, in a more general uh, sense, it allows uh, to make the exchange and connection in the art, uh, uh, art world more uh, accessible, providing different ways to help artists and creators. You may have uh, noticed that I uh, passionate about preserving history. Uh, the current tragedy of the Russian media avant-garde, as Greenway has pointed out, is because we haven't learned from the past. I see uh, Cifra not just as a streaming uh, service, but as a vibrant audiovisual encyclopedia for the future. And uh, one whole team uh, is uh, spread out across the glo globe. 
However, uh, media and technology keep us connected. Uh, I've been uh, fighting for freedom for more than uh, 30 years, and media art has always been there with us. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was really great. And uh, we Thank still you. have one wonderful other person too, Natalie. Thank you so much. <laughs> And Nina, you are the part of our history. <laughs> well, I, you know, I didn't want to, I felt it's better if you talk. And, but I have been a few times to Russia, back from the 90s. I went to the media art lab. I saw you there. Yeah. My name is Natalia Kaladze, and I am an art historian, curator, and also director of the Kaladze Art Foundation. And thank you so much, Piero and Nina, for your kind invitation for today's talk. And uh, I know today we are diving into the story and the history of uh, alternative media art and communities, as well as collecting, preserving, and displaying and lending digital media. But I would like to touch to touch upon the history of nonconformist art. Ever since I remember myself. I was surrounded by artworks, which my mother, Tatiana Kaladze, collected over 50 years. On my first birthday, uh, Ukrainian-born artist uh, Pyotr Belenuk gave me my first work of art, which became the seed of my own collection. And today, the Kaladze collection of Russian and Eastern European art has grown to 7,000 objects, including paintings, drawings, sculptures, photography, multimedia, video, installation by more than 300 artists from Russia, Eastern Europe, and the former republics of the Soviet Union. The main criteria we use in selecting works were originality, talent, and quality. The particular movement any given artist belongs to was of less importance. The collection is, in effect, is a historical document illustrating the development of the main trends in nonconformist and contemporary art from Khrushchev Thor to the present day. In order to establish some historical and cultural context for the development and introduction to the media art, at least in our collection, it is important to outline some part of history of nonconformist art in the 50s amidst the Khrushchev so a new wave of art emerged, challenging the prevailing socialist realism style. This movement known, known as nonconformist art represented a spiritual awakening, a yearning for freedom. Despite lacking of unified aesthetics, nonconformist artists shared a common desire for individual expression and artistic freedom. They rejected the rigid constraints of Soviet ideology, instead seeking soulless personal exploration and formal experimentation. Uh, my mother, Tatiana Kaladze, met Josh Kastaki, the prominent collector of Russian avant-garde, when she was only 17, and she saw her his collection and caught the collecting bug for life. His collection and those of several other private collectors, like Yakov Rubinstein, Abram Chudnovsky con contained works by artists that could not be seen anywhere in Russia. Popova, Klutze, Chagall, Malevich, Kandinsky, Rochenko, Ritko, their works were not displayed in official museums. They were kept in storage facilities, which were closed to the public. Those facilities were treated as they were secret military sites like silos with atomic weapons. Weapons. One could not even say word abstraction out loud. It was term employed only as hostile ideology. The atmosphere in Kastakis was always warm. Many artists frequent his place, and these uh, visits influenced them greatly. This enabled many people to see the original of the Russian avant-garde and to grasp the significance in the 20th century. The collection also contained the works by many artists like Anatoly Zverev, Dmitry Plavinsky, and Dmitry Krasnopetsov. 
those artists of a later generation. When uh, my mother started collecting, she could not even imagine that it would be the seed of extensive collection, and in turn, it would serve as the basis for American-based foundation. The Soviet Union was the closed country with the with totalitarian regime. At the time that our collection was housed in two rooms of communal apartment and was shown only to friends who were interested in contemporary art. Rumors about it snowballed, new works began appearing in the collection from all parts of the Soviet Union, from Georgia, Estonia, Latvia, where my mother Tatiana traveled often. Every period has a temporary borders and historical capabilities. In the last centuries, life proceeded gradually. And if the artist, instead of tempera, used oil, it was already a revolution. Every young artist with the creative potential strives to use new materials and to express new ideas. The advantage of the 20th century that it allows the coexistence of many different different uh, trends without canceling each other out. There is a long tradition of an intersection between art and science and technology, and especially in the conformist art. And I just would like to touch briefly on two artists, Vyacheslav Klitschuk and Francisca Infante, who balanced the scientifically based kinetic and geometrical abstract art with metaphysical views of art. The, the easing of aesthetic restraints in combination with interest in heritage of the avant-garde and uh, exploration of space produced an interest in geometrical abstraction and kinetic art. And between 1962 and 74, the движение, the movement group initiated by Lev Nussberg in, in, included in many in early years both Infante and Kalichuk, who combined interests in engineering, science, technology, space, and art to propagate the kinetic art. Space exploration had opened a perspective on the infinite. Preparing for the exhibition Kurchatov Center, Nussberg wrote the Manifesto in 1966, which was published abroad in British and Czechoslovak periodicals. In addition to the commitment to kinetism, he announced the dawn of new sensibility. He said, we pioneers, we unite a world to kinetism. The движение movement connected, was, was concerned with synthesis of different technical means and art forms, redesigning the surrounding environment, the symmetry and production of spatial compositions, the geometrical structures. In 66, the regional group split, and Kalichuk went to organizing his own group, and Vant Infante and his wife Nona Grunova organized their own group. The complexity of ideas arising from intersection between art and information theories, between individual interests and common expectation enable the artist to pursue the ways of thinking about art and society, to envision the immersive installation that offered the viewers a glimpse into the unknown future. Later, the kinetic artists tried to combine and balance aesthetic explorations with official commissions. For example, Dvizhenia uh, did a work for the 50th anniversary of October Revolution. The, Vyacheslav Kalichuk, he's a prominent kinetic artist and the scientist. He produced six, six inventions, several books, and over 40 scientific articles, including one in the, for Leonardo Journal. Kalichuk is a here to early 20th century avant-garde and is, reflect, is, uh, is reflected in his preoccupation with the processes of form building and the existence in form in space and interaction also of form and the color. In this respect, his works echoing Rochenko and Egonson, Tatlin and Malevich. In his own work, he paraphrases the constructivism ideas into new idiom of special relationships. An example, when George Kostakis had, uh, was at a loss what to do with the Rochenka construction, it was my mother who suggested uh, uh, Kostakis to reach out to Kolichuk and uh, ask for the restoration. Today, this work is on display at the Museum of Modern Art in New York.
So in his art, uh, Klitschuk concentrated on the experiment theoretical development of form, overcoming the limits of materials, kinetic and programmed art on creation of paradoxical create, uh, kinetic constructions and visual models and images, and in search for new means of artistic expressions. The previous slide was one of his atom construction, which uh, Garage created in 2017. Uh, Francisca Infante, he is another prominent kinetic artist who is engaged into metaphysical and geomet geometrical artistic quest through, throughout a wide range of activity from early works on paper to painting to paintings to kinetic constructions, performances and artifacts and installations. His early spiral se series emphasize his interest in mobile and dynamic systems. And uh, he, from, from 1976, Infante has explored art form, which he terms artifacts, synthesizing uh, natural and artificial, defining a geometrical object, uh, is geometrical object which is introduced into the, into the natural environment. Object of secondary nature, a thing made by a person that's autonomous in the relationship to the nature. In this context, nature and the artifacts operate on an equal, equal footing, supplementing each other. In fact, the creates installations nature, and then he photographs them. That metaphorically transforms the surroundings nature by introducing the preconstructed geometrical reflection, reflective objects, which later on he dissembles. The outdoor, the outdoor constructions eventually uh, are taken away, leaving nature intact, and the artifacts remains only in photographs image. In Infanta, that's inspired the dialogue between nature and artist and the, and the viewer. The avant-garde was distinguished by a numerous collaboration. Barbara Stepanova, Alexandra Rochenko, Alexander, Alexander, Alexei Kurchony and Olga Rozanova, Natalia Goncharova and Mikhail Larionov, Infanta and his wife and colleague uh, uh, Nina, uh, Nina Gurinova, as well we heard today from Elena Gubanova and Ivan Gavarkov. Also, there is no single unifying uh, factor uniting all, all, of, all of these artists. They share a commonality. Even if their styles are different, their works themselves had their inceptions in the shadow and the rise and decline of the Soviet Union and carry the marks and, pre, uh, and, and the end of the era and the beginning of the nebulous future. Over the years, many artists moved to you know, United States and uh, we, we made a lot of efforts to connect art spaces. This in 2000, in, in, in 2004 and five, we organized the exhibition of Oleg Vasilyev, uh, Memory Speaks Themes and Variations in the State Russian Museum and Critical Gallery, uh, connecting his, career, his artistic career, uh, which he, he've done in, in, the, in the States and in Russia. And as well as in 1995, we uh, organized the International Association of Collectors of Contemporary Russian Art uh, under the foundation. And we hope that museums and the private collections, especially such as Northern Dutch and, and the Zimmerian Museum, will play a prominent role in defining the place and significance of nonconformist art uh, in nonconformist art in the world context today. And my mother first uh, first uh, met, uh, met Northern Dutch in seventy four and introduced him uh, to many artists. Uh, and uh, is, is including including uh, Kolichuk and uh, Francisca Infante. And uh, his uh, the, the work by Komar and, and Melamid Soul of Northern Dutch became the symbol of our exhibition Moscow New York where it will play. And that's the uh, photograph of his Northern Dutch. Uh, in, in, in front of in front of uh, his soul and uh, he was very happy how we safekeeping his soul uh, 
So how do we progress from an unconformist art to collecting and preserving di digital and displaying digital based art of Russia and Eastern Europe in Eastern Europe? Digital computer internet art, as we heard today, have been created for many years and they have entered the mainstream of art world. And the Whitney Biennial showcased uh, uh, the digital work as early as 2000. As we discussed today, the early history of digital art in Russia has an extremely complex history due to several factors, including uh, geopolitical, like isolation from Western art movements, lack of access to multidisciplinary institutions, such as, for example, MIT. And today we traced uh, with uh, uh, Anna Franz and Olga, Hish uh, Olga Shishko uh, the inception of digital art in Russia, starting from the mid-90s, the community-driven net art, digital interface to exchange of visual and political information online to today's complex hybrid works and techniques that rely on digital media in their creative processes. So how we how we uh, how we display and collect those fragile and hybrid and vulnerable works. Many archiving and, pres and preserving strategies include one more of, of the three main approaches uh, in preserving digital information, the static, the migration, emulation. However, even in combination, it is difficult to balance between the data and the appearances as it may cause an acceptable loss when dealing with the multimedia digital artwork. What are general guidelines for museums to redisplay digital art? What are museums do? What the collectors need what the, the collectors need to to be to be technically prepared to preserve uh, and redisplay artworks. What are the new formats for the exhibition? How can we display uh, conformist and the digital art together? What ideal collaboration between uh, curators, artists, and collectors? These are the challenges for each institution and the collector like ours as they entering and launching accession of works of digital media into their art collections. In 2021, the Kaladiert Foundation marked 30 years of encouraging a more diverse art world by advancing knowledge of art of Russia and Eastern Europe. We are delighted to collaborate with Silent Media uh, Art Lab on a number of projects, including presentation of SciFest Festival in New York. In 2022, uh, we uh, had a joint exhibition ID, Art and Tech, selection from the Kaladier Art Foundation and Franz Family Collection at the Museum of, of uh, Russian Art in Minneapolis. This exhibition featured works by uh, 45 artists, including Russian, Russian American, Ukrainian, Ukrainian American, and Estonian. So, uh, Providing a context is one of the most important mission for all the museums. And for, dig for digital works, the context is often in, in combination of preserving documentation about the specific work and producing educational and scholarly material which enable access to the artwork as well as, as uh, safeguard its environment. Context is especially important in preserving work which are distributed, ephemeral, or interactive, such as digital art. With this respect to digital art, context is necessary on both the human and technical level. Digital art frequently present, uh, present, presented in dynamic network technical and social environment which may include a human to machine human to human machine to machine interactions and others therefore while collecting work of digital art it's often necessary to document the environment and to allow the future generation like my daughter who is depicted here in the photograph in front of Diana Franz work to better understand the context behind it so it's important to recognize that 
we may not be able or capable of amassing and complete and, and amassing the complete artwork, but merely certain sides of it. So while uh, preserving and uh, redisplaying media media artwork of many in of many cases, we, we should also consider the information aspect of digital artwork, and as as well as well as the physical object of this artwork. As often, in the in, uh, as often, it's not only monolithical object. The Kaladze Art Foundation is this is very proud to contribute to the dialogue around digital artwork by, by, by presenting digital artworks in connection with the foundation's exhibitions, uh, including uh, this leads to fire in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Newberger Museum uh, concerning the spiritual art in the Museum of Russian Art, Moscow, New York, Parallel Play in Chelsea Art Museum, uh, part of the uh, I, I, I do art and tech in, in different institutions. And uh, that's uh, photographs from the exhibitions in the National Arts Club in New York. So uh, we we don't want the new generation to, we, we, we don't want the present generation of our talent and contemporaries to wait for 70 years for the recognition. We hope that museums and private collections, especially Silent Foundation, will play a prominent role in defining the place and significance of media art in the world context. There are, of course, many, many un 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 unanswered questions for a long-term solution for collecting and preserving media art. For uh, preserving media art is digital and as, as digital art techniques develops, they create and explore new viewers' experiences and interactions, artificial life and intelligence, challenging and changing the creative process and our ways we create the meaning. The life of the collections continues. Thank you. Hey, can I ask a few questions? Sure. Um, so, the, 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 I mean, in a sense, it's also uh, an explanation of why we're doing this uh, this special. How did it start? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it started uh, pretty much the same way the, that Peter Greenaway and uh, that uh, uh, Dutch curator, remember the name, uh, came up with the exhibition on uh, on the great uh, Russian avant-garde. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that we're we're all sort of nostalgic, puzzled fascinated but by, by what happened a, a century ago in uh in Russia uh, it's uh it's just amazing I mean uh, in the in the visual arts you had Malevich and you had uh, uh Tatlin uh in uh, in the poetry you had Mayakovsky Klebnikov you had ballet classical music uh novels I think Bellis Petersburg is one of the great novels of the century and of course, cinema, Eisenstein, Vertov. So it was <clears throat> diversity, it was radical, and it was unique. So my question is really, what is unique about Russian art today? Uh, but before, <clears throat> uh, do you have a theory why that happened? I mean, why, why a century ago Russia, not Paris, not Berlin, not London, why Russia had this incredible multitude of uh, diverse and radical um, uh, art? I think it's important that any like uh, the new ideas in uh, in philosophy in society always bring the inspiration to the artists. So uh, the the, uh, the beginning of the twentieth century was an exciting moment in the history. I mean, with all this uh, turmoil and, uh, I mean, uh, there was a lot of innovation. So the artists really, really uh, responded to it. Some of them in a political manner, some of them in an artistic manner. But I think that's one of the reasons, because they responded to the society and to the changes. Uh, also, it was important, I think, the revolution, uh, not because it was good or bad, but it was the 
pale of settlement for Jews. And uh, many artists were able to live in the cities and be the part of the uh, the part of the artist community. That's I think played one, one of the one of the factors. The, in the in the Tsar Russia, they have to uh, Jews has to be uh, live outside the city with the very small exception. Okay, how unique is Russian art today? Why ask this question? Because if I go back to a century ago. <clears throat> Russian art was not only so vibrant, but it was unique. And what Malevich did was really, really different from what uh, uh, Western Europeans were doing. So how unique is uh, Russian art today? And in which way? Uh, it's very difficult to, uh, it's very difficult question, but I would like to uh, remember the uh, walls of curator Ralph uh, Rugov, uh, uh, who once referred to a well-known Chinese saying, God forbids us from living in an era of change. Uh, nobody wanted such change like uh, Russia uh, had uh, during this century. And uh, maybe Malevich uh, uh, um, predicted uh, uh, this revolution. And um, it's a uh, very difficult question, but uh, uh, Peter Greenway uh, explained to the Russian audience uh, what uh, was the happened, the revolution for the, uh, for, for the artist, uh, because the golden age of Russian avant-garde uh, it was a project which criticized a lot of my friends who are specialists of Russian avant-garde. Because for them, it's a beautiful period with some, uh, only with some brilliant uh, artworks. Uh, but uh, they for, uh, forgot that it's what a strategy for this person because the um, uh, they dream uh, to the new era, to the uh, new state uh, uh, were crashed. Uh, and uh, our beautiful story, because uh, the Russia not calm, <laughs> and uh, uh, some strategy uh, burns some brilliant uh, idea, maybe. I don't know. But uh, what about the contemporary art uh, in Russia? Uh, it's a very interesting question, because when uh, 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 before the beginning uh, uh, of this war, uh, the situation was uh, normal with art. But we felt the uh, um, uh, censorship, uh, but uh, um, uh, we could to do something new with media art, with a new idea. It was the like play with uh, liberation person. Uh, and now I feel that a lot of uh, beautiful artists left Russia and maybe it will be something new. Maybe some new ideas uh, will born in the kitchen of uh, in Russia, and uh, another a new idea will born uh, in uh, outside of Russia. I know a beautiful artist. Uh, um, uh, it's my uh, advice to see this mapping diaspora. Uh, there are a beautiful project of Andrei Kuskin uh, or Ksenia Petruhina or uh, Mikhail Durninkov, uh, Dmitry Krimov, they left Russia and now they no stop. They continue to work and continue to, uh, to do uh, new uh, work uh, uh, with uh, deep uh, feeling, with uh, new strategy, uh, tra a tragedy. Yeah, I think also so it's... it's important not to forget that we had 70 years of dictatorship and censorship. That's the one of the factors. Sorry to interrupt again. No, I just wanted to say to, I started to go to Russia in the 90s, and but I worked uh, in the 90s in the Bauhaus and we had the Australia, many Russian artists coming in. The sense of innovation 
and curiosity is really was always on such a high level. And look at Cyfest, you know, I mean, it, it was really such a wonderful, uh, just to walk in into your exhibitions. They were uh, always just getting in some of the newest, it was, era, it was the era of fresh air, not only in Russia, but in uh, all uh, Soviet bloc, uh, past Soviet bloc, uh, in Hungary and uh, in uh, Polish and uh, maybe in, uh, you Ukraine. you noticed it more because of the co contrast uh, with other uh, you know other more conservative movements. Um, for me, ask me it. 90, 90s years, it was like third avant-garde. Uh, for me, the first avant-garde, it was uh, on the beginning of the 20th century. The second avant-garde, it was after the uh, Second War, uh, when it was the uh, second emigration. <laughs> and uh, it was the uh, censorship and the uh, artist uh, um, participated in the kitchen exhibition. It was the close post art yes uh, and the uh, 90s it was uh, like uh, art fresh and it was the third avant-garde for russian uh, culture with um, a deeper uh, influential of media art and uh, for my opinion it was the uh, inspiration from a uh, source center from different uh, country from different person who didn't uh, uh, fear to come to Russia. Yes, because on the beginning of the 90s, I remember that uh, Katie Ray Hoffman, uh, Ray Hoffman phoned, uh, there wasn't the uh, um, uh, email, only fax and font. Uh, she called a uh, different person. And uh, um, uh, some uh, uh, from them uh, refused to come to Russia. It's mm, very dangerous. It's not for us now. Uh, but Woody, Stein, Hendy, Peter, uh, Weibel, uh, another person uh, agreed and uh, uh, gave us uh, um, new possibilities and new, uh, new, uh, new ideas. Uh, but uh, uh, like uh, Katie Ray, Ray Hoffman wrote in your article, Media art plus Russian avant-garde plus experiments of kinetic art, uh, the movement, uh, the движение movement uh, uh, made the beautiful effect. <laughs> and uh, in the 90s, it was the uh, beginning of the net art and uh, Alexei Shulgin and Dolly Lalin uh, uh, were the stars of net art. Uh, like uh, text and visual and uh, um, uh, past and new ideas um, uh, combined and uh, and but from the beginning of the twenty uh, one century it was uh, it was a new uh, era and uh, they opened it a lot of festivals but. Uh, I felt uh, another um, uh, energy, and um, uh, it was uh, uh, low energy because uh, person feels uh, uh, this uh, uh, new way to the propaganda, to the censorship, etc., uh, etc. Et Unfortunately, okay, I have a question. I have a question like... about the intelli intelligence. Sure. Yeah. Uh -huh. So the the so Anna Anna was mentioning censorship and so on, but so the intelligentsia was uh, was very very influential, no, in the past. I mean, even the fact that, that there was such harsh harsh censorship on the musicians, filmmakers, and so on, in a sense, it was because they were considered important. I mean, Stalin in person was going to listen to Shostakovich. And watch movies and uh, and uh, right, so uh, what's what's the role of the intelligentsia today in uh, in Russia? But you know what uh, Piotrovsky made? Uh, it's uh, awful. It's uh, uh, for me. It's uh, tra my personal tragedy because I worked in the state uh, state museum and uh, I. Uh, Mm. 
I waited that everybody uh, said something, yes, intelligence. Uh, but uh, a lot of people uh, affirmed uh, the letters uh, against, uh, yes, and uh, these people left Russia. And another person uh, now uh, continue uh, working, uh, maybe it's... Uh, um, um they uh, doesn't see another way it's difficult it's very difficult because uh, we know the process with berkovich with another uh, person from intelligence who uh, uh, can't uh, uh, to have the silence uh, uh, and uh, it's possible to 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 be uh, calm to, uh, to be um, Couple of skates. <laughs> uh, to be without world, uh, 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 words, yes, uh, to be silent. Well, unfortunately, answering your question, uh, unfortunately, it looks like the rush is sliding back. Uh, in the 90s, this was a great time period because uh, everyone was influenced by the potential freedom. Right now, we are uh, getting censorship again. I mean, most of the intelligentsia, unless uh, someone had like old parents or some other factors, uh, they left Russia. That's actually what Olga's um, project uh, is about, uh, uh, diaspora. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm absolutely clear on, on your question, Piro. Uh, uh, about intelligentsia, what do you want to know? Like, do they feel the same now uh, as they felt? Yeah, so first of all, how they feel and their, their role in society, but also how society sees them. Uh, because my impression is that uh, in the past, even during during the, the, the communist era, uh, society was looking up to the intelligentsia. That's why we call them intelligentsia. They are a class that was somehow important in defining uh, the mood of the country. Uh, well, I'm not sure. It depends where where you come from. I mean, it's definitely not the same as it was in the Soviet times. I think the factor with after 90th when the uh, country got divided financially, like most or most of the money uh, was in Moscow. Uh, the younger generation grew up respecting not the uh, intelligence and books and knowledge, but money. I don't know if Olga agrees with me. At the beginning of the 20th century, it was the ideology, but now not. But in all those, all the area, not only Russia, but in Central and East Europe, for example, I mean, the changes are so big and up and down in one's lifetime. You know, it's it's not that uh, three generations before, in one's lifetime, you go, uh, I thought that I'm from Budapest. I thought I'd go back and I worked a lot in the Central and East Europe. And now it's getting Difficult. And I presume that you are even more aware of that. Yeah, that's that's why we, we left. I, I I won't go back and Olga is uh, left her post at Pushkin Museum and went to Venice. Yeah. Well it's sad, but anyway, we cannot change it. Here. Well, uh, in a positive on a positive note, I think the media art and the technology as a as an instrument in in our case uh, might be different from the previous previous art forms. Uh, it's not no doubt that there always were good artists, but because of the same years of censorship and not communication, we basically lost those years. But media art is, I think, is different. And what do you think? I mean, I work with some young up and coming artists who are now really involved more and more with digital arts, digital tools and so forth. Uh, I don't know whether that provides 
uh, more freedom or uh, more dependence on tools. But I wonder whether, what do you think in Russia, how is this going to uh, evolve? Uh, well, the the tool, tools, technical tools, first of all, it's a very fine line between entertainment and art, in my opinion, and you have to uh, um, uh, respect this line if you want to be on the art side. Uh, it's very popular right now, and actually it's the part of the propaganda, uh, as far as I understand. Uh, the current situation with the war, with the current intelligentsia and artists are leaving uh, to the west or to the east, this matter we're like uh, well all over. Uh, it might produce new generation of young artists that stayed inside Russia. So I don't know, but that would be my guess. But they they won't be able to communicate from uh, with outside. But they but when they come and exhibit or not. Is it difficult now? Uh, it's, uh, first of all, it's, 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 difficult, it's difficult to, tra to travel. Uh, it's possible, but it's very difficult. There's okay. no Facebook, no Messenger, <laughs> unless you jump over the API. So it's really not good. Yeah. Piero, what about... I'm done with my question. You have done with the questions. Do we I'm have any? My <laughs> do we have any people uh, in the uh, audience who have any questions, or they are gone by now? Uh, no, they, but they, they it, had it, some compliments, and then uh, my friend Robert is asking something from Natalia. But maybe it's better if I just put them in touch uh, yeah. uh, by email. Yeah. But to me, it seems now it's the right time to actually. To educate people what was happening during during the avant-garde movement, during the conformist movement, and also look uh, at the history of the media art as well. So that's the right time actually to create and to participate in the international exhibitions. Mm -hmm. well, we, need, we, we need audience. We, we need the audience. That's why I'm really happy that... Uh, uh, I mean, we are uh, like we and also Anna France, we all like American based uh, organizations are reaching out to different American institutions. And actually, we are in dialogue with them and we are and we are planning the other exhibitions, both on media and combination like on hybrid forms, the media, paintings, uh, sculptures, uh, kinetic objects. I think that's an important part of the dialogue, which we, all of us, which we need to participate and to continue. Yeah, it's no difference in uh, material you make the uh, the artwork uh, with. Uh, it can be uh, paints or it can be programming. And uh, younger artists or not younger artists or older artists, when you uh, do your next side fest like in Yerevan? Are they able to come and bring uh, their artwork there and uh, participate in the festival? In Yerevan, yes, it's it's really easy to come. It's direct flights, and it's uh, uh, it's uh, I forgot what it's called. It's uh, called custom union, C customs union. The the uh, like Belarus, uh, Russia, uh, Armenia, I think Georgia. They're in one unit. Let's see. But I, I, I get uh, lots of messages from uh, artists who work, who work with media from all over the world. Like an hour before our meeting, I got a message from some guy with a project who relocated to Mexico City. <laughs> yes. Mexico, Argentina. <laughs> yeah. As, as in from inside, I can say that uh, the big project is closed now, most of them. And uh, like Olga said, that uh, uh, very, very not popular, but common uh, small exhibition, the uh, uh, kitchen exhibition or something like that, like uh, or some corridor exhibition. Uh, 
uh, for young artists. It's still alive, but a big uh, project. It's not. No, that, that's why I was thinking it was important for me just to remember those times of an unconformist art back in the 60s and 70s, when there was like a kind of tight community of like everyone, like artists, musicians, they were all kind of united in the kitchen conversations. I think we're coming back to that. Yes, and but in St. Petersburg, it's uh, in spite of Moscow, which uh, was still alive till the, you know, no, no, no time, because it's uh, in Saint Petersburg. It's uh, um, the small community of artists uh, was a very, very popular, and uh, for example, Parazi group, the Parazi group, and uh, other ones, they started to be together for during uh, many years to survive, because in Saint Petersburg have not so mu much money like in Moscow, and they have not. Uh, you know, collector and uh, and said to who who can buy or not, and now we we come like uh, Natalia said we back to this time to the uh, Soviet time the kitchen uh, conversation and kitchen exhibition and like Anna said that maybe we will see the new generation who grown from the uh, kitchen. Uh, Tears at kitchen, <laughs> something like that. And that's for um, um, intelligence. Uh, two days ago, the very famous art critics that in Saint Petersburg, Arkady Palitov, as I know, a lot of people for for a lot of people, it was really tra tragedy. So I think that uh, impression or meanings are uh, really interesting and clever and uh, professional people, intelligent people. It's uh, still uh, survive. It's still need for the for the art community, but uh, of course, unfortunately, more, a lot of uh, most of them now it's far far away. But now the big immigration uh, is in uh, uh, Paris, uh, in French, in uh, Berlin, in uh, Germany, in Georgia, in Armenia. And I have just returned from um, uh, Paris, uh, and I met with a lot of uh, artists and musicians, and they work uh, every day, and uh, they create uh, uh, something new, new exhibition, new performances, new media artworks. It's very interesting, and uh, the audience, the friends, audience, interesting in uh, their activity and uh, uh, the cultural center uh, sub, uh, support, uh, uh, supports them and uh, uh, try to create uh, some uh, condition for their work. Uh, Daniel has a question in the in the QA. Uh, let me rephrase it my way. Uh, I, I hope Daniel doesn't get offended. Uh, it's a question her question is uh, if there is mentorship between the the older Soviet Eastern European artists and the new digital um the new generation of artists. It, there's a disconnection of uh, mentorship. And the way I rephrase, I rephrase it is, uh, do the new generations of artists, the younger ones who were maybe born after 1991, do they respect the artists who struggled during the Soviet times? Uh, do they look up to them? Or do they just consider it, you know, Ignore it in a sense. Lena, I think that's a question for you. You are the old generation artist. Do they respect? <laughs> I would say no. <laughs> I don't know. No, but it's all it's all it's also it's all depends on, on the artists. I mean, right now we had quite a few retrospectives, for example, for the kinetic artists, for this artists who were like uh, creating works in the late sixties and seventies for like Dvigeni and uh, Infante and for the Kalichuk. So there was all interest 
that they are practicing and actually reviewing them in a different light. So, but it's, I think it's the most important uh, in today's world that uh, all the trends are valid and we learn how to coexist, not only like uh, as a humanity, but also how to coexist as an artist. If you practiced one uh, one uh, style, you you don't have to hate the other style. Uh, yeah, I, it's not about hating the other style. I think it's for uh, uh, sh uh, want to listen. Yeah, not uh, hearing. Yes, no, not hear, not hearing. The the uh, younger generation they know better. It's always have been a problem between generations, but especially with the changing. Uh, uh, in 90s when the parents like uh, who were respected in Soviet time and uh, were the let's say academic uh, um, and artistic uh, uh, environment they are not respected by their children because they don't have money and the my their new ideal like businessman and uh, uh, you don't need to listen and study to make money that's the, the the main thing maybe the next generation will be different uh Daniel is complaining I disabled the chat I if I did that it was by accident I I wouldn't know how to do it so I don't see how I did that maybe it's something I have to learn how to do <clears throat> okay well we've done uh, two hours. So uh, I thank you. Thank I thank you. you. Piero, thank, you. Thank, thank you so much. We really should because you have done thank it. Thank you so much, Piero and Nina, for having us. That's really, really important. Really. Yeah. Thank I'm, you. I'm sure, I'm sure this is just... You. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank I'm you. sure this is just the and tip of I the iceberg. I thank all the speakers mm -hmm. because actually uh, I was a little bit hesitant. I am not Russian. But I have been there many times, and I really admire a lot of the art which is produced there. So I'm happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.